This is going to be our first lesson on genetics, and in this lesson we're just going to be discussing some of the basics of inheritance. Now, at one point in time, scientists thought that inheritance from traits being passed from parents to offspring was always seen to be blended. That is, um, traits of the mother and traits of the father were combined in formed some kind of intermediate trait, some kind, something in between, red plus white equals pink or something like that. But um, this fellow, Gregor Mendel, was the one that actually discovered that inheritance doesn't happen that way. He discovered that some traits will disappear in a generation. So sometimes red and white don't make pink. In fact, red and white sometimes makes red. And that's what he discovered, that sometimes these traits will disappear and they will reappear later in uh, uh, the grandchildren or the great-grandchildren. Now, we, he called these inheritable units. We didn't know at that time what genes were. We now know that his heritable units were actually the genes that are made up of DNA. Um, but it was Gregor Mendel that discovered this. So before Gregor Mendel did his work, um, this is what we thought, red, and white, we'd have pink somewhere in between. But Mendel's theory and his work showed that inheritance was particulate. That is, there are heritable units, heritable particles that separate and do things, and so you don't always get a blending. Instead, what you get sometimes is the white, in this generation, the white disappeared and you get only red. So here's what we know now based on Mendel's work. We know that each gene has two or more variations. We call these variations alleles. So there's the first of many vocabulary terms in this lesson. These alleles are inherited on pairs of chromosomes. We've already talked about chromosomes being diploid. Um, and these chromosomes come one from each parent. So you get two alleles, one from each parent. Just to remind you, this is sort of a cartoon version of what a chromosome looks like. And the chromosome is made up, if you recall, of DNA. And along the chromosome, there are genes that are portions or pieces of DNA. Now, sometimes we're talking about alleles. Sometimes one allele masks or hides the other allele. The one that always shows we call the dominant allele. And the dominant allele is represented by a capitalized letter when we're doing genetic studies. The other allele, the one that is masked or the one that hides, we call recessive. It's a recessive allele and we indicate it using the same letter but this time in lower case. Now usually the letter you choose is the first letter for the trait that you're looking at. Now another uh, vocabulary term is genotype. The genotype of an individual is their complement of genes, so what letters they have, what genes they have. For some individuals, they, both alleles are recessive, so the recessive trait shows it's not being hidden by the dominant trait. We call this homozygous recessive genotype. So the genotype or the complement of genes is both recessive, both alleles recessive, and we indicate homozygous recessive with two lowercase letters. For other individuals, perhaps both alleles are dominant. In this case, the dominant trait shows, but we call this homozygous dominant. By the way, homo means same. Zygous refers to the zygote or the offspring. Um, and so this is homozygous dominant. We indicate this using two capital letters when studying the genes. Now, the other thing that could happen is that an individual could have one of each allele. In this case, the dominant trait shows because now the recessive is hiding behind the dominant trait. We call this heterozygous, hetero meaning different, and we indicate this using one and one lowercase letter. Now, whatever genotype an individual has, is deter it determines the phenotype. The phenotype is the trait that shows. So if you are homozygous dominant, you show the dominant trait. If you are uh, heterozygous, you also show the dominant trait. If the, in this case, the recessive lowercase b is hiding. And the only time you see the recessive trait is with a homozygous um, recessive genotype. Now, because of Mendel's work, Gregor Mendel's work, um, he came up with two laws of biology, scientific laws. The first is the law of segregation. 
And the law of segregation says that these heritable units, remember these are genes, the heritable units separate into the offspring at random. This is saying that all genes separate independently of other genes. Okay, if Mendel's law of segregation is correct, then we should be able to predict the outcome of a cross. So if we look at the cross between um, two homozygous individuals, this is our test cross. In this case, we're looking at seeds, pea seeds. He studied peas. Um, I'm sure you heard about that, so I'm not going to go into that, the detail of that. But um, if we take the dominant seed, which is round, and we cross it with the, the recessive trait, which is wrinkled, in the first generation, we call it F1, we get all heterozygous and all round. That's the trait, the phenotype. If we look at probabilities mathematically of the outcome of a cross between two of these heterozygous hybrids, they're called, we prepare something called a Punnett square. A Punnett square, and that's what this looks like. It's like a mathematical probability square. So we have possible gametes in, um, let's say, the male. We have capital R or lowercase r because this individual is heterozygous. But in the female, the same thing, capital R versus lowercase r. So if we're crossing two of these hybrids, this is the possible um, gametes that can be produced by that individual. Now you simply plug in the probabilities and you end up with um, the cross from a monohybrid cross. So when Mendel made these predictions and then he actually crossed the pea plants and looked at the results, he found a set ratio. He found exactly what he had predicted. In the F1 generation, which is that first generation, which was homozygous dominant crossed with um, homozygous recessive, in the outcome, the offspring were all heterozygous, 100% dominant. But in the next generation, if the F2, that was crossing the two heterozygous individuals, there was always a 3 to 1 ratio in phenotype. So if we look back here now in our monohybrid cross, of course, indeed, we have 1, 2, 3 smooth peas and 1 wrinkled pea, which is our 3 to 1 ratio. So here's the idea behind Mendel's law of segregation. First of all, fertilization is random. It's a chance event. So which egg and which sperm come together is chance. Therefore, the outcomes are predictable using math, which is what we just did. The probability of each event is proportional to the number of ways it can occur. So it's just mathematical probability, and that's what explains how traits are inherited. So Mendel's test cross of the heterozygous, um, the hybrid cross, it will determine the genotype of an unknown phenotype. So you can do a back cross or a back check. Um, in this case, the dominant phenotype could be either homozygous or heterozygous. Maybe you don't know. You do the test cross to determine if the individual is heterozygous or homozygous dominant. It uses a homozygous recessive individual. So if you think about the cross between a dominant phenotype and a homozygous recessive, if the unknown is heterozygous, you will see a 2 to 2 ratio in the offspring. However, if the individual is homozygous dominant, then you get 100% dominant in the offspring. So that's what we call a test cross that tells us if um, our dominant individual is heterozygous or homozygous. Mendel's second law was developed later. It's the law of independent assortment. And this has to do with the fact that cells are diploid. They have pairs of genes on pairs of homologous chromosomes, as we've learned. The two genes of each pair are separated during meiosis and end up in different gametes randomly. So the law of independent assortment tells us that those homologous chromosomes all segregate randomly during meiosis. So Mendel crossed two homozygous lineages for two different traits, okay, for instance, color of peas and height of, of the plants. So it would be crossing these two. We have homozygous dominant and uh, homozygous recessive. And in the result, he found that the dominant phenotype, all offspring showed the dominant phenotype, and this was their 
genotype. He didn't know that, but we know it now. This was their genotype. And we call this a dihybrid because they're a hybrid for two traits. This is going to help us to understand Mendel's law of independent assortment. So he then did the same um, kind of experiment he did with the test cross with the monohybrid. Um, and in the F2, he got a ratio based on all possible gametes in the F1. Again, it was mathematical. All genes sorted independently of the others. We ended up with 16 possible genotypes, but in the phenotype ratio, it was always 9 to 3 to 3 to 1. So let's take a look at that. So this looks a little tricky, but this is how it works. We have our P generation, homozygous dominant for two traits, homozygous recessive for two traits. In the F1 generation, we have our dihybrid. Then crossing two of these dihybrids, the possible gametes, we have capital, 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 lowercase, 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 capital. Those are our possibilities in both directions. So if we now look at the possible outcomes, um, you end up seeing six, you have 16 boxes, you have all the eight, nine different pheno, genotypes, and then when you look at the ratio of the possible phenotypes, you have nine here that are yellow and round, you have three that are green and round, you have three that are wrinkled and yellow, and then you have only one that's double recessive, which is this guy right here, which is wrinkled and green. So this is an example of what we call a dihybrid cross, and it helps us to prove, in fact, Mendel's law of independent assortment is true. Now, what I've discussed in this lesson has to do with um, what we call Mendelian genetics, which is a straight, basic understanding of how uh, genes are inherited on chromosomes. But this doesn't hold for all genes. There are complexities, which we will talk about later.